grace and peace be multiplied to each of you this morning in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. You may notice this morning that I'm wearing my clerical collar. Some of you have inquired about my wearing of the collar at recent events, so allow me to explain a little bit of the history and the purposes behind the clerical collar. The black shirt most commonly worn when the collar is worn uh, symbolizes mourning and death. It represents for both the minister and the people that we die to ourselves and through the invitation of Christ can rise and serve the Lord as with the The white collar. We're going to buy a new mic. There we go. All right. I'll, I'll try one more time, and after that, I'm going to take the handheld. The white collar on top of the black shirt uh, symbolizes the renewal that comes from the blood of Jesus Christ, which purifies. Um, you'll also notice that the collar is banded around the neck of the minister. That is a symbol of the minister being bound to the person of Jesus Christ. And there are two gold pins that are holding this collar around my neck. You can't see them. But in that same way, the minister is bound and held to Jesus Christ. Uh, you may not know that the collar is born. I'm going to take the handheld. Appreciate it. Thank you. You may not know that the collar is worn by ministers in a variety of church traditions, Anglicans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Baptists, Roman Catholics, and yes, even in some non-denominational churches, the collar is worn. In some settings, such as the Church of God in Christ, the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world, it is a requirement that clergy wear the collar when officiating uh, church business. They have to be in their vestments. In other settings, such as some Baptist churches and many non-denominational churches, it's up to the minister if, when, or how frequently they wear the collar. So entering into my 10th month as your pastor, I've decided that every first Sunday for the foreseeable future, I'm going to wear my clerical collar. The collar is the most universal symbol in terms of dress that communicates to the public when a person is a minister. You don't just wear this in ordinary life. You don't go to the grocery store and wear a clerical collar. Uh, and if you do, you maybe are dressing up on Halloween as a minister, and I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, so when we wear the collar in public, for example, I went to Starbucks this morning, as is my custom before church on Sundays, and evidently when I walked in, people give me a second look, a second look that they would not give me if I was in street clothes, because this is recognizable amongst all, even people who have never been in church before, that this person is a minister. And, you know, that reminds people that there still is a sacred office on earth through which God speaks and shepherds and nourishes his people. Um, relatedly, when the collar is worn, it communicates to people, specifically church people, that the occasion of our gathering is meaningful. You know, church has many different expressions in 2023, and I appreciate most of them, actually. Um, some churches have big LED boards, others have smoke machines, some have big high pulpits, others meet in renovated Kmarts, um, some have ornate stained glass everywhere, some pastors wear sneakers every Sunday, some pastors wear robes every Sunday. I actually appreciate almost all of these expressions because I think in them we see the beauty and the diversity of the kingdom. And you all know that I'll wear a suit one week and sneakers and a t-shirt the next. But there is something to be said about a sense of formality and reverence when we come to church. Not because we want to be formal for the sake of formality. That can slip you right into legalism, and we don't want to go there. But when we gather here on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., this is altogether different than gathering to go to a ball game or brunch or any other quote-unquote worldly activity on a Sunday morning. Now, trust me, good theology will lead you to the recognition that all of life is holy, for God is in all. He's the omnipresent God. And so, certainly, 
the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. You can be at the ball game and sense the holiness of God. You can be in the grocery store. You can be brushing your teeth in the ordinary and know God is with me in this moment. But I contend that the only way you're able to recognize the holiness outside of these walls is when you have a sense of reverence and holiness for what takes place within these walls. And not just these walls, but any walls where we are assembled as a real church in Jesus' name. So uh, my choice to wear the collar on first Sundays, along with some other more formal elements that have been introduced and may continue to be introduced on first Sundays, is to remind you that this is a set apart and a holy time. So some of you have approached me and say, hey, I actually feel more comfortable dressing up. And so I'm going to dress up a little bit more. If you want to dress up, dress up. And if you don't want to dress up, don't dress up. I don't care. I just want you to come and worship. And I also want you to come with a reverent heart, ready to receive from God in this space. All of that actually was the setup to my sermon. The collar is a universal symbol of the minister. And by that, we might mean the capital M minister. Those persons who have been duly licensed, commissioned, ordained, recognized by a church body as a preacher. But according to the New Testament, if you're in Christ, you are a minister too. You may never preach a sermon you may not hold church office, you may never wear a clerical collar, but if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a minister. You're a minister of the mystery. This morning, the question I wanna put before you is this. What is the mystery? of which we are ministers. That's the question I want you to keep in your mind for the duration of this sermon. What is the mystery of which we are ministers? To answer that question, meet me in your Bibles in the book of Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. As you're turning there, would you please stand for the formal reading of God's word as you're able? Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to begin reading at verse 1 and read through verse 13 from Ephesians chapter 3. The words will appear here on the screen as well out of the English Standard Version, but in whatever translation you have in front of you, you can follow along. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, reading out of the English Standard Version, this is how the Bible reads. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church 
the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. This morning, I want to tag this text in our exchange, Ministers of the Mystery. Would you read this word of prayer with me? Father, we thank you now for the ministry of your word. God, I thank you that you are exalted, the devil is defeated, and you are going to speak and minister in this place. So would you open our hearts now as we prepare to hear and receive from you, O God. I thank you that, Holy Spirit, you live inside of each one of us. And so we just simply ask you individually now to fill us, O God, that as your word is opened and as we come to the table, the real presence of Christ would be so rich and heavy in this place that we're able to see and behold the glory of our King and that we leave transformed. So Father, I pray now that you would help me to preach, grant unto me clarity of thought, concision of speech, and deep conviction of heart, and anoint the ears of your people that they may hear. We thank you now and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we tiptoe back into Ephesians, we find ourselves at the beginning of Paul communicating to the church in Ephesus his prayer for them. Look with me again at verse 1. If you closed your Bible and perhaps you're new to grace, welcome to grace. You can keep your Bible open for the duration of the sermon. You'll need it. Look with me again at verse 1. Look with me again at verse 1. Look with me at verse 1. Paul says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Now, if you're reading out of an English Bible, such as the English Standard Version, the New International Version, New American Standard, you can see the ESV here on the screen, what do you notice after Gentiles? little dash, okay? That dash is there to communicate that after verse 1, Paul, in typical Pauline fashion, decides to break his flow of thought. He begins communicating in verse 1 what his prayer for the Ephesians is going to be, but he doesn't end up getting around to that prayer until verse 14. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. What are the first three words of verse 14? What are the first three words of verse 1? Okay, so in verse 14, Paul resumes what he starts to say in verse 1. In verse 1, he says, for this reason. In verse 14, he says, for this reason. The question then is, what is between verses 1 and 14? We have an aside. You all know what an aside is. You'll be in the middle of saying something to someone and then you kind of dip off and have a side conversation as part of the main conversation. Paul, if you're going to read him rightly, breaks off into these asides quite often. And there's a lot of richness in these asides. So we're going to have to wait until next week to actually get to the prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians because he decides to take up some 13 verses. Of course, there were no verses in the original manuscript. That's important for you, by the way, when you read your Bible. Chapters and verses were added hundreds of years later. It was just one long-running manuscript. But nevertheless, he decides to add a lot more words in between for this reason and his eventual communication of his prayer for them. So I'm going to treat this aside, this interruption, this break in Paul's flow of thought in two parts this morning. Um, first, I want to make the case, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that we are ministers. That's going to be my first point this morning. I want to make the case that we are ministers. And then I want to explore the mystery of which we are ministers. So point number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It's quite simple. We are 
ministers. Flip over with me a page in your Bible to chapter four. Flip over with me a page in your Bible to chapter four. I see some new faces at Grace. Welcome to all of our visitors. If you are new you and you did not bring a Bible, there should be a Bible right in front of you. You can flip over with me to chapter four of Ephesians. And look with me at verse 11. Look at verse 11 of chapter four. Paul says, and he being Jesus gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Question for you, pop quiz time. According to this text, who does the work of the ministry? The saints. You see that in the text? The text says that he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But those five offices in this text are not the ones doing the work of the ministry per se. Those five offices were given to equip you, the saints, so that the saints can do the work of the ministry. If you do the work of carpentry, you are a carpenter. If you do the work of painting, you are a painter. And if you do the work of ministry, you are a minister. You may not be a capital M minister, meaning you may not be formally ordained by a body and operating an official church office. But you nevertheless, according to this text, are a minister. So, since you are a minister, not just me, not just those like me, but you, a member of the body of Christ, are a minister, let's sit down with our brother, the Apostle Paul. And let's glean from him as he pulls back the curtain and elaborates on his own ministerial call in this aside in chapter 3 after verse 1. So flip back with me to chapter 3 and let's glean some nuggets of wisdom from Paul about ministry. The first nugget I want to pull from Paul is going to be the first sub point of this main point. So you'll have to track with me this morning. I have two main points, but the first point has three sub points. Here's the first sub point of this main point. Ministry will cost you. Ministry will cost you. Paul does not write this letter to the Ephesians from a weekend vacay in the Virgin Islands. He does not write this letter to the Ephesians from a local coffee shop sipping on a latte. Nothing wrong with the Virgin Islands, nothing wrong with a latte. But Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians from prison. Do you think Paul wanted to be in prison? You think when Paul was hoping and dreaming about his adult life as a child, prison was in his plans? Paul is in prison because of ministry. He was in the uncomfortable place of prison because he ministered the gospel of Jesus Christ in contexts that were opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you are newer to following Jesus, I wish I could tell you that following Jesus won't cost you anything. But the reality is, if you're going to follow Jesus and by virtue of following him, be a minister of him, it will cost you. You may not go to prison, but ministry will cost you time. It will cost you energy. It will cost you money. Salvation is free, but how many know that ministry costs money? Ministry might cost you some friendships. It will cost you some sleep occasionally. 
Ministry will cost you the right to always be perfectly understood. People might misconstrue your sincere efforts and create ideas or stories about you, and ministry will cause you to give up the right to defend yourself in those moments. Ministry will cost you. This is why Jesus said, before you follow me, count the, count the costs. Paul is in prison, and prison is not comfortable. You know, prison today and prison in the first century are not the same, but they do have something in common. Prison is not fun. It's not designed to be fun. Think about this. Paul is sitting in prison, not just a visit to prison, but he is confined to prison and he does not know what his future will hold. His ministry cost him. Here's a reflective question I want you to think about. What is your ministry costing you? I want you to think about that. If you are doing ministry, I contend that your ministry is going to cost you something. What is your ministry costing you? Now, to be really clear, I'm not advocating for death at the altar of ministry. I don't believe the Bible is calling you to sacrifice your physical, mental health, your family for the sake of ministry, and certainly not a church, because ministry is bigger than one church. Ministry is a lifestyle. So please don't walk away and hear me say that you just need to die at the altar of ministry. That's ministry idolatry, and that's a whole other sermon. You don't have to sacrifice everything, but if you're going to do ministry, it will cost you something. And my question to you is, what is your ministry costing you? That's one nugget from our brother Paul. Here's another nugget. Ministry is from God. Ministry will cost you. Ministry is from God. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 3. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. Drop down to verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul was not a likely candidate for ordination in the first church of Jerusalem. Our brother Paul is the same man who once breathed murderous threats against the way. He was not a criminal killer per se. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of the law. He was a zealous persecutor of the church. And to him and those like him, the way of Jesus needed to be stamped out. I mean, for those of us who have been around church a long time, we're a little bit familiar with this, so we almost don't even hear this anymore. But I want you to actually think about this. Imagine being in the first century before Acts chapter 9. Before Acts chapter 9, Saul, as he was known then, is ravaging the church. So place yourself as one of the earliest members of that first church in Jerusalem. You know, the only church that can actually claim being the first. The first church of Jerusalem. Imagine being there. You have a clear enemy. His name is Saul. Next chapter, he gets saved. And then, soon after, starts preaching about Jesus. This was not a long period of time from him getting saved before he starts proclaiming his Savior. Imagine getting word that your enemy, this man you are terrified of, this man whom perhaps you know personally people that have been killed underneath his oversight, 
now he's a preacher? Now he has the audacity to travel around and tell people to come into this? Would you trust him? It would probably take some time for you to trust him. Paul knew something that I want to make sure you know. See, your story is not Paul's story, but there's a theme we can pull from Paul's story that is applicable to you. Ministry is from God. Ministry is not from people. If Paul was looking to people for his approval in ministry, he would have never gotten started in his ministry. And if you are looking to people to give you your cue card for your ministry, you'll never get started in ministry or you'll get started in ministry and then be in the trap of people pleasing in ministry. And how many people who have been in ministry for a long time know that if you get in the trap of people pleasing, you're not going to last in ministry very long. Or it won't be fun. Because one person says this and another person says that, and now you don't know what to do. Oh, I thought my ministry was from this person or these group of people and this person and that group of people. No, your ministry is not from people. Your ministry is from God. God gives people their ministry. In the book of 2 Corinthians, in which Paul is the most honest and vulnerable as he is in any other letter in the New Testament... He talks about the wounds of ministry, and in that book, his legitimacy in ministry has been questioned, and so he has to present a case for himself in this book. I challenge you to read 2 Corinthians in its entirety. If Paul was confused about where his ministry came from, he would have quit. Paul's ministry was from God, and if you are going to make it in ministry, you have to know that your ministry is not from people. Your ministry is from God. So when people start doing what people do, you don't have to retreat and quit in ministry. You can go back to God like Moses did and say, God, you're the one who called me into this, so I need you to work this out, to supply me with what I need, because this ministry you have given me comes from you. It's the second nugget about ministry. Here's the third nugget about ministry underneath this point of we are ministers. First, ministry will cost you. Secondly, ministry is from God. Thirdly, ministry is for people. Prepositions are important. Ministry is not from people, but ministry is for people. It's right there in the text. Look with me again at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Paul says, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, and that's not a false humility on Paul's part, by the way. He's not one of those people who actually is quite puffed up with himself. Oh, I'm just the least of all the saints. You know, I'm the, no, he, he legitimately recognizes that he is the least because Paul remained very in tune with who he was before he came to Christ. He had a real conversion story where he was knocked down and his eyes were blinded and he had direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul knew that he was the least. So he says, look back in the text, that was an aside, you know, kind of like Paul does. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given, here's the key part, to preach to the, what does your Bible say? To the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Mind you, Paul is a Jew, but here in this text and elsewhere, he says he was given the ministry he was given so that he could preach to the... The Gentiles were Paul's people. I want to ask you another reflective question. Who are your people? Who are the people... God is calling you to minister to. Now, you could say everybody. And sure, I suppose for some of you, that would be an adequate answer. But I think for many of us, we can get a little bit more specific. You may or may not be called to minister to everybody. You might be called to minister to the residents of Lansing or to the people on your block or to the people in your house, because your own home can be your ministry. 
or, and I say this for our brothers and sisters who might be watching me online or hearing this after the stream because they're unable to come to the gathering, your ministry might be for the people in your hospital room. Your ministry might be the people in your classroom or on your job or college students, or the elderly, or the incarcerated, or the wealthy, or musicians and artists, or people with differing abilities, or new mothers, or people in this church, or the body of Christ at large, fill in the blank, but you have a people God is calling you or has called you to minister to. You could say I'm called to minister to everybody, and like I said, I suppose that's true. But you can get more specific and identify through the leading of the Spirit, who are the people God is calling me to minister to? Now, here's the thing. Over the course of your life, you will likely minister to different groups of people because seasons change and your calling to different people will change. And spiritual maturity will require you to know when one season is up and when God is calling you to move to another season. But nevertheless, what you'll find is in every season... And some of you have been walking with the Lord a long time, and you can testify to this. In every season, if you're walking with Jesus, there will be a people for you to minister to. So here's another reflective question for you. In this season of your life, because look around this room right now. We've got a lot of generations in this room. We've got a lot of different types of people in this room. So everybody's ministry is not going to be exactly the same. Some of you are just starting off in life. Others of you are enjoying these golden years of your life. It's going to look different for each person. Who are your people? Ministry will cost you. Ministry is from God and ministry is for people. Here's my second main point. We're ministers. And this is what we are ministers of. The mystery is that Christ unites all people in the church. Look with me at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Paul says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Drop down to verse 9. Picking up in the middle of the sentence, Paul says, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. The mystery is that Gentiles are fellow heirs. Now, this is not the first time you have heard this. If you were here two weeks ago, you heard Andy unpack this from chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, that the Gentiles who were once far off have been brought near, and Christ is our peace. He has broken down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. For those of you who were here, you remember that. So I don't need to lean into that too heavily as if you haven't heard it before, but I do find it interesting that Paul, just a few lines after basically just saying that, finds the need to say it again. Do you notice that in the text? If you've been tracking along with us week after week, like he, he's already announced to the Ephesians that the Gentiles have been brought near. He did that in chapter two. So why would he repeat himself in chapter three? Did he forget after he wrote it in chapter two what he just wrote? No, he's saying it again because they need to hear it again. They need to hear again that in the church, all people are brought together to be one. And as was the case then, I think is the case now, we need to hear that again. And here's why. Unity is a great idea. 
but it is a difficult reality to live out day in and day out, week in and week out. Almost everybody agrees with unity on the surface. Yes, let's be united. I agree. But then when you begin to pull the strings of the implications for what it means to be united, that's when you get into the muddy water. And no doubt that was happening here in Ephesus. They obviously didn't mind unity because they came together as one church. But Paul comes back to say again, through you being one in Christ and one with one another, the manifold or multifaceted wisdom of God is made known to rulers and authorities and powers in the heavenly places. I'm not going to lean into this super heavily this week because we have a whole second half of the series left. And the second half of the series, which will be the second half of the book of Ephesians, gets real specific. Oh, this is what it means to be unified. See, the first half of the book announces to us what Christ has done for us, and we can cheer and be excited about that. But the second half of the book comes along and it kind of smacks you in the face a little bit because now it says, okay, since Christ has done this for you, this is what it looks like for you to live this thing out. Not in your own strength, but in his grace. And not as an individual, but collectively. And truth be told, it's in the collective where it gets difficult. It's in the collective when you have to do this with that person or those people who have that thing and you have this history with or you are suspicious of in this way or they, you know, that's where it's more complicated. So I'm gonna back off of that a little bit this week because we got a whole half of a series left to go. But I do wanna encourage you with this. I wanna encourage you with that line from verse 10. According to verse 10, when we live as the church, the multifaceted, I want you to think about a diamond. If you've ever seen a real diamond or perhaps are privileged enough to have one on your finger right now, you understand this. A diamond is multifaceted. Okay, you can't just look at it and see everything that there is to it. You gotta look at the intricacies of that thing. There's all sorts of dimensions and layers to it. God's wisdom is multifaceted. And this text says that when the church is being the church, new dimensions of God's wisdom are made known to spiritual beings. So when we forgive each other, Angels know another dimension of God's wisdom. When we speak the truth in love, principalities in the spiritual realm are shown the manifested wisdom of God. When we worship together, angels can peer off the glass of heaven and see an aspect of God that they otherwise would not have known because we have a story that even the angels themselves don't have. I wonder if we, week in and week out, took that seriously, how it might fuel our life together as a church. God has chosen us the foolish things of the world, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, to demonstrate and show his manifold wisdom so that rulers and powers in the heavenly realm can see him more because of what they see in us. What is the mystery of which we are ministers? Here's the big idea of my sermon. We are ministers of the mystery that Christ unites all people in the church. That's the mystery of which we are ministers. 
you might be wondering, and perhaps you've been wondering it this whole sermon, I'm going to tell you now, well, how do I minister? I hear you saying that I'm a minister. Okay, whatever, not lowercase or not uppercase M, lowercase M minister. How do I minister it? Here's how. Words and deeds. Through what you say and through what you do, you minister this mystery. And so today I want to encourage you to be who you are. I want to encourage you to be a minister. If you're here today and you would say, well, that really doesn't apply to me because I don't even believe in Jesus. I want to extend an invitation to you now to confess with your mouth and to believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. You know, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. And, and what that means is we don't know the day nor the hour in which our Lord's going to return, but we do know that right now, while we have breath and our eyes are blinking, we have the opportunity to follow him, to give our lives to him. So if you're here and you've never done that before, I want to extend an invitation for you to do that right now. We don't have to have a special service. We don't have to call a meeting for you to give your life to Jesus. Jesus could return tomorrow. I want today to be the day where you can make that decision. And if you're in need of renewal, in a moment we're going to come to the table. And I make this appeal every week those of you who have been drifting to come back. But this week, as we come to the table, and as is our custom on every first Sunday, it's a moment for each one of us to hit the reset button. Just by a show of hands, how many of you need a reset this morning? Yeah. We need renewal in our walk with the Lord Jesus. Because it's hard, and life is hard. And the beautiful thing about the table, and these are such ordinary elements. I mean, this is a little flaky wafer and some prepackaged juice. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing special about the elements inherently. But there is something special about when we gather in the Lord's name to eat these elements together. The Lord gives of his real presence in a special way. So this week, I, I want to invite all of you to hit the reset button. When you come to the table and to experience the nourishment that the Lord is going to provide for you. So as we begin to transition and our elders come forward, let us have our scripture reading. This morning's reading is going to be 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23 through verse 32. Can you stand if you'd like to join me? Everybody have it? Okay. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of our Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. 
when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. To God be the glory. Before you come around, why don't you do that? Take a moment to examine yourself. Not your neighbor, but you. As I've been sharing and I'll keep sharing, such examination can be both of those introspective sins, those personal sins. But sin isn't really that personal or individual. Sin is communal. And so if you have sin against a neighbor, unresolved conflict or issue, something that you're harboring in your heart, maybe even against someone in this room, and you need to make it right, do it now. of you on my left, you will be pushing out to the aisle and you can come around to be served. Likewise, those on my right will push out to the aisle and you can come around to be served. Once you return to your seats, would you remain standing and let's worship and celebrate our salvation together.
everyone's been served. Okay. What you're holding in your hand is representation of blood. Now, are we just a bunch of gory freaks that assemble, you know, to drink symbolic blood? I mean, think about that, right? Like, you think about the things we do here in church that people just don't do outside of church. We're here to drink something. Look at it. Look at it. This isn't blood, by the way, if you're visiting, okay? You're not drinking blood. You're not even drinking wine. This is juice, mass manufactured juice. But we're doing this because it is represent. blood. And here's why we do this. The Bible says that life is in the blood. If I were to suck all the blood out of your body right now, you wouldn't be living anymore. Do you not know that sin was like that? Your sin sucked the blood out of your own body. And in the words of scripture, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And so do you know what you needed? You needed a blood transfusion. You needed someone else's blood to be applied to you so that you could live. And on a hill far away, 2000 plus years ago, blood was shed. It was not my blood, it was not your blood, but it was the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. And that blood was not ordinary blood because there was no man in the conception process to make the body from which that blood spilled. It was the blood of Jesus himself who knew no sin but became sin so that when his blood was shed, the very ground on which it was shed was purified and you and I who would be born 2,000 years later can still be saved by that same blood. So when we drink this and when we eat this little wafer that is symbolic of his body in which is life, we are being nourished afresh because he's not dead. He is living and he has ordained this, the simplicity of this to be the means by which he's going to give you the grace you need to wake up tomorrow morning and go to work or to go home and to deal with family members or to not cuss somebody out on the road this week when they cross you off. You know what I'm saying? This is going to be the means of grace that he nourishes your soul with right now. That's why we do this. We're not freaks. We're ordinary people in need of an extraordinary God, and he's going to use this ordinary symbol to give us extraordinary strength. So on the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and having broken it and given thanks, he told his disciples, take, eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Church, let us eat together. In like manner, he took also the cup. He told them, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink ye all of it. Church, let us drink together. Glory to God. Glory to God. You may be seated. Let's receive now our announcements. <laughs> 